We're going to officially open. Let's give a round of applause to Miss Julia Buckingham for the prelude. This is a young lady that we have watched grow up here. She was a piano student of Dr. Bates. And as she has matured as a pianist, she has kept her loyalty to this university. And we so much appreciate the fact that when we call, you come. Thank you so much. And now let me say good morning to all. Good morning to all. Good morning. All right. And welcome to the 2013 Fall Faculty Staff Seminar. This is the beginning of the new academic year, a year of hope and a year of great opportunity. How great that opportunity will be will be determined by your level of commitment to what you're going to hear this morning from our speakers. Our program, if you've had a chance to look it over, and I really would hope that you would do it and look at the design and, and, and the thought that has gone into this, be sure to read the message from the chancellor and, and, and watch this program because the 16th came on a Friday. So we couldn't get out three days in a row. We have a weekend there. But don't forget, Monday morning, you have a lot of activities and on into Tuesday. So be sure to put that into your electronic calendar and all so that you can take part in all of the events that are planned. I want to tell you a little bit about the purpose of this session. The purpose of this session, this morning session, is number one, to let you hear the Chancellor's vision and his primary goals for 2013-14. So when you leave this auditorium, you should be fully aware of what the vision is and what the major goals are. After the Chancellor speaks, we will have mics that will walk around and if you have questions, he has already consented to do a question answer session with you. Secondly, we want to focus on the fact that we are in transition and get it in our heads on how you deal with change. So we brought in a dynamic speaker who will be introduced to you later who will talk to you about the whole process of managing change. We want also to reacquaint you. Most of you are already acquainted, but for the new faculty members, but the policies change, and so we all need to revisit that. So we have workshops this afternoon dealing with the policies and expectations of UAPB employees. So after lunch, which will be special, we want to see just as many people. We have planned for 450 people moving around in these workshops. So we're going to be counting and making sure that we have our numbers there. So when we record it for the future, we will be able to document the fact that we did provide this essential information to all of you. So it's important that we, we do that. Tonight, we, are going to, we have a special private invitation to a private reception at Sissy's Log Cabin starting at 6 o'clock. We hope to see you there. And another major goal of this workshop is to allow us to celebrate the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and celebrate each other. So we hope that you enjoy the breakfast and the networking opportunity. When we have the breaks, do that. Try to get to know someone that you don't already know that well during the course of this event. So with that said, let us now go ahead and acknowledge all of the key people. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge Chancellor and Mrs. Alexander. And I'm going to ask them, because they are just joining us, to please stand and receive a warm UAPB welcome. Mrs. Alexander.
All right. That, that, that's, that's the UAPB welcome that we have, and we are so happy to have you join us. To um, all of the persons on the stage, to all of our guest speakers who have joined us to help deliver the message on this occasion, to all of the UAPB faculty, staff, and students, as well as retired faculty, staff, and administrators, we welcome you so much to this occasion. Thank you for joining us. Your presence is awfully special, and our program is going to proceed as printed. We will have an official welcome to this occasion by the Vice President of the Faculty Staff Senate, Dr. Cedric Rice. Good morning. Good morning. I am here today with the awesome task of bringing greetings to faculty, staff, students, alumni, friends of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff to the Fall Faculty Staff Seminar. Our theme this year is Bridging the Past to the Future, UAPB in Transition. Before I go any further, I would like to make a few acknowledgments as I try to summarize my main points of the greeting in the next couple of minutes. I would like to first and always thank God for the wisdom and strength to stand before you today. Because of God, I know who I am and whose I am. I would like to thank my late mother for her strength and heart and my living father for his morality and wisdom. I would like to thank my wife, Shara, who could not be here with us today for her loving support and delicate but firm words of encouragement during the chaotic and troubling times of my life. I would also like to thank my children, Jonathan, Sarai, and of course, Baby Schuyler, for creating some of those chaotic times in my life, sometimes stretching my nerves to the limit, thereby prompting me to be very creative, physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially. Children are a blessing, and to me, there is no greater or more challenging experience than being a father. To my mentors, both living and those who have gone on to glory, thank you for loving me enough to tell me the truth and providing me with the excellent role models of success in my transition to becoming a better person and professional. To the fall faculty seminar coordinators, thank you for putting me on program. And that's a church joke. And finally, to my dear, dear mother, my alma mater, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, thank you for being an institution of higher learning that has stood the test of time and enriched the lives of me and so many others. We owe you, dear mother, so much. Our theme for this year's Fall Faculty Staff Seminar is Bridging the Past to the Future, UAPB in Transition. When I thought about this year's theme, I immediately thought about the relationship, affinity, and linkage between the past and the future. In a historical context as it relates to our lives, and wanted to try to connect the dots to events that support the transition of not only the human race, but also the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. First, I thought about the impact of the Holy Bible the best-selling book of all time, and how its Old Testament and New Testament anthology sections allow God to bridge his word from past to future generations. The Old Testament author spoke about prophecy and promise, and the New Testament author spoke about fulfillment and revelation. Then I thought about our institution and how I transitioned from Branch Normal School to Agriculture, Mechanical, and Normal College, am and in, and then the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Next, I remember some of our institution's famous models, including a no excuse university, education with a personal touch, UAPB, where you will be proud to be. Then I got excited and thought about our past and famous alumni corps, which includes Martha S. Lewis, Danny K. Davis, Samuel L. Kuntz, David DeWitt Chapel, John Stubblefield, L.C. Greenwood, Dr. Charlie Nams, Dr. Hazer Reed, and others and how their influences led to our present and famous alumni corps, which includes Smokey Norfolk, Dr. Anissa Buckner, Dr. Jesse Walker, Dean Carla Martin, Dr. Charles Colon, Dr. Anthony Rice, Ms. Tisha Arnold, Adrian Hatchett, Kriana Childress, Teron Armstead, and many others who are now blazing a new historic path forward and helping to bridge UAPB's past to the future. Finally, where will we be without the leadership of our presidents and chancellors? A special group of men and women who have helped our institution as faculty, staff, and students endure more than 140 years of existence and transition through the long-term and severe psychological and socioeconomic impacts of slavery on the people, illiteracy, poverty, institutional, corporate, and systemic racism, 
world wars, Jim Crow laws, segregation, separate but not equal, desegregation, Voting Rights Inequalities and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the struggle and violence related to the Civil Rights Movement, the assassination and death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., affirmative action and anti-affirmative action legislation, economic disenfranchisement of people and groups, unequal funding for HBCUs on the state and national levels, budget cuts, decreased enrollment, and now issues with providing often underrepresented and socioeconomically disadvantaged populations throughout the Arkansas Delta with access to quality education. Beginning in 1875 with Joseph C. Corbin, then Isaac Fisher, Frederick Vinegar, Jefferson Itch, Charles Smith, Robert Malone, John Brown Watson, which brings us to 1943, where we received leadership from Dr. Lawrence A. Davis, Sr., the first alumnus to lead our institution and the youngest president of a college and university in the United States at that time. He presided when our institution transitioned on July 1, 1972, from A&M College to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Dr. Johnny B. Johnson, who served in this capacity twice, Dr. Herman B. Smith, Jr., Dr. Lloyd B. Hackley, Dr. Charles Walker, Dr. Carolyn Blakely, which brings us to the early 1990s when Dr. Lawrence A. Davis, Jr. took the reins of the flagship of the Delta and led our institution for more than 20 years. To Dr. Calvin Johnson, who graciously accepted the responsibility of guiding our ship through troubled waters until our, lead, new, until our new leader arrived. Now, Dr. Lawrence B. Alexander is Chancellor of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and is working to bridge the past to the future in helping UAPB transition as an HBCU with an evolving mission. Using his unyielding trust in God, family support, vision, experience, and leadership abilities. In the good book in Hosea 4, 6 states, my people perish from a lack of knowledge. President John F. Kennedy stated that history is a relentless master. It has no present, only the past rushing into the future. To try to hold it fast is to be swept aside. So to all of that said, Greetings and welcome to all faculty, staff, students, alumni, visitors, and friends of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff to the Fall Faculty Staff Seminar. Let's learn our institution's history. Let's remember our institution's history. Let's make an, am an impact on our institution's history. history. We are UAPB and are a part of a historic family. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Rice for the environmental scan, for a revisit to our history, and preparing us to go into the future. We appreciate your leadership here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. When we have a major seminar, it is always important that we have a reflective moment. We're going to have a reflective moment this morning, and it will be followed immediately by the solo. The reflective moment will be given by Dr. Hazel Linton, professor in the School of Education. The solo will be done by one of our students here from one of our outstanding departments, the Department of Music. Our Vesper Choir, as you know, is internationally known. And so anytime we have one of these students to perform for us, we are just seeing the product of that outstanding department. So Dr. Linton will be followed by the solo by Mr. Echo Sampson, who will be accompanied by Ms. Julia Buckingham. Dr. Linton. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to, for this reflective moment, offer two pieces. They are very short. One, in respect for our theme, the bridge builder by Drum Ghoul, a short paraphrase if you don't mind, slight paraphrase if you don't mind. And then the other one, just because you're, we are all so special, letting go. An old man going along highway came in the evening cold and gray. So a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him. But he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. 
you never again will pass this way. You've ch crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge at the evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I've come, he said. That followeth after us today, many youths whose feet must pass this way. This chasm which had not for me, to those many youths a pitfall would be. They too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friends, we are building this bridge for them. And finally, letting go. There's nothing to fear. You're as good at the be as the best. You're strong as the mightiest. You can win in every battle or test. But there's no one just like you. There's only one you in the world today, so nobody else you see can do your work in a final way. You're the only one and the only you there'll be. So face the world and all life is yours to conquer and love and live, and you'll find the happiness that endures is just the measure you give. There's nothing too good for you to possess, no heights where you cannot go. Your power is more than beliefs or guess. It is something you have to know. There's nothing to fear, you can and you will, for you are the invisible you. Set your foot on the highest hill. There's nothing that you cannot do. Will you bow your heads, please? Father God, this day we ask that you help us to do our best, be our best, and act our best, and above all, to see the best in others. We praise you for what you've done for us and what you're going to do. Amen. candle by the water side to see the little children when they truly baptize honor honor unto the dying lamb king jesus lit the candle by the water side to see the little children when they truly baptize honor honor to the dying lamb Or oh, run along chilling and be baptized Mighty pretty meeting by the water side Honor, honor unto the dying lamb Or oh, run along chilling and be baptized Mighty pretty meeting by the water side Honor solo. Let's give him another round of applause. We are so proud of our students here at this university. And Dr. Linton, thank you for a very reflective, reflective moment here for us. We needed that. And now we are prepared. I think that we are all gathered. We were already here in a physical sense. But I think that now, mentally and psychologically, we are here and ready to hear from our chancellor. 
we're going to ask Vice Chancellor Pauline Thomas to do the honor of presenting our Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Thomas. Good morning. Good morning. I am glad to be here this morning and have the opportunity to introduce to some and present to others our Chancellor, Dr. Lawrence Alexander. The theme of the seminar is Bridging the Past to the Future, UAPB in Transition. One definition of a bridge is a connecting, transitional, or intermediate route between two adjacent elements, activities, or conditions. I would like to introduce to you the man who is at the hem to the future of our bridge. <coughs> Chancellor Lawrence Alexander hails from New Orleans where he received his bachelor's degree in drama and communication from the University of New Orleans. He received a master's degree in journalism and communication from the University of Florida, a Juris Doctorate from Tulane University, and a PhD in higher education from Florida State University. Prior to committing to UAPB, Chancellor Alexander served as the Associate Dean of the University of Florida Graduate School and the Director of the Office of Graduate Minority Programs. Chancellor Alexander has held several administrative positions throughout his career and, was, and he was a journalism professor. He has also served on numerous committees and, ha and has taught thousands of students. Our Chancellor is distinguished, published, awarded, and most importantly, he is dedicated to student advancement through his education, through education. He has a plan for UAPB's bridge. Would you all please stand and join me in welcoming our head lion, CEO, Captain, our Chancellor, Dr. Lawrence B. Alexander. Thank you, Ms. Thomas for that wonderful introduction. Uh, that was very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Touched me. Good morning. Good morning. I bring greetings to the students, to the staff, the faculty, stakeholders, and friends of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff family. Happy roars to all of you. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here for this annual faculty staff seminar. Uh, we, we are pleased to be here, and uh, Dr. Benjamin's already introduced her, but I'll introduce to, to others. My wife is here, Veronica. She's sitting right down here on the first row. Our First Lady, Veronica Alexander. I would make you stand, but that's not me. We are now full-blooded Arkansans. And we now bleed black and gold. People who know me will tell you that I've always worn the black and gold, as I've been a long time fan of the New Orleans Saints. <laughs> but now I'm proud to wear the black and gold of the Golden Lions of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Go Lions. Yes. We are delighted to be here. We're grateful, humble, honored, to join the pride of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Most importantly, we are blessed for this opportunity. We understand that this is an opportunity for us and for the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff to move forward. We too would like to express our heartfelt appreciation to Chancellor Johnson, Chancellor Calvin Johnson, 
for all of his help and guidance and assistance. We honor his dedication to this institution and we commend him and his wife for their outstanding dedication to this university. We appreciate the foundation that has been laid over the past year by Chancellor Johnson and the foundation that has been laid over the last 21 years, the prior years, by Chancellor Lawrence A. Davis, Jr. and all of the previous leaders over the past 140 years of this institution, we pledge to build on their successes that they have achieved. We have appreciated over the past few weeks, we've been in Pine Bluff about eight weeks now, we've been on the job about six weeks, but we've appreciated all of the, the smiles and the welcomes and the cordiality and the receptions. We feel we have been well received by this community. And for those of you who were here, and many of you were, on July 1st, for that wonderful hail and farewell ceremony that was planned on that day, thank you. We are grateful. We believe that the true greatness of any institution can best be measured in the quality of the collective work of the inhabitants, the faculty, the staff, the students, the alumni, the other stakeholders. Let me pause at this moment and say thank you to the staff and thank you to the faculty of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. It is my great pleasure to inform you, as if you didn't already know, that the university community and to inform all of the stakeholders that the state of this university is strong. And that the needle is moving in the direction of making it stronger. We're on our way to greater status and recognition. We are seeking greater prominence, not for ourselves, but for the institution. We are moving from good to great. We are a university that is student focused, that is success driven, and that is mission based. This institution is strong in terms of its staff and faculty productivity strong in the success of his students who persist to graduation, and strong in the university's ties and connections to the local community. The university has accomplished much in the last year and in the last few years. Time would not allow me to go through all the accomplishments that the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff has seen over the last year, a few years, but I wanted to just highlight some things in this talk this morning. Accomplishment number one, you have a new chancellor. <laughs> you know, chancellor searches are not easy. And this one was, like most, a year-long process that involved all of the academic and, and, and local community in the search process. And it is no less difficult for some of the candidates as it is for the folks at the university. But like you, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> I'm glad I'm the one chosen. <laughs> and I look forward to working with you uh, for many years to come. Accomplishment, to some degree, number two, is that I was informed when I got here and interviewed that you had been involved in customer service, uh, in, in sort of highlighting customer service and holding yourselves accountable in terms of the customer service at this university. And I tell you, so far, I've seen it. 
People didn't have to tell me that. I can see that there's a high level of customer service here. But you know, customer service is a funny thing in that you never really get there. You never really are there. You're always working toward that higher goal and that higher plane in customer service. I was pleased to see on last November when you gathered outdoors on a cold November day for the groundbreaking of the STEM Academy and Conference Center building. We look forward with great anticipation to the completion of that facility by the summer of, of uh, next year. We also were able to establish on this campus the Minority Research Center on Tobacco and Other Addictions. Uh, the center was granted initial funding of $400,000 by the Arkansas Department of Health through the Master Tobacco Settlement Funding. The university also received grants totaling over a million dollars from agencies that included the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the Arkansas Science and Technology, and support for STEM Scholars Academy. And there were many, many other accomplishments. I'll mention a few more. The Council of Accreditation for the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences granted accreditation to the Department of Human Sciences. The UAPB Agriculture Department was recently awarded $175,000 for a grant to explore more sustainable methods for growing strawberries in the United States consume, for US consumers. Aquaculture and Fisheries Department over the last few years uh, was launched and it started a, a PhD program and has admitted its first PhD student and we and, and, I, and I look forward to the privilege of being the one conferring the first PhD on the Aquaculture and Fisheries Department graduate. We received the Higher Learning Commission approval for a master's degree in computer sciences and technology. We've helped to establish summer research internships for 25 STEM scholars. We've received national reaccreditation from the National Council of the Accreditation of Teacher Education in Cape back, in, back last year for the College School of Education. We've started planning and work is underway in business and management school for the accreditation next year by the Accreditation Council for Business Schools and Program Site. And the, the site visit is coming this fall. There's been a submission. We have submitted a proposal for the associate degree in general studies. There's been approval of an expansion of the Honors Residence Hall in the John E. B. Johnson Housing Complex, the Watson Library, catapulted UAPB's research capability with the acquisition of a discovery system, Lion Search, so not one-stop research platform for end users, the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Advising, in fall 2012, and an online student enrollment of 62 online courses, and in the spring of 65 online courses. The Department of Military Science achieved 150% of its mission by commissioning, 100% of its goal by, by, by commissioning nine new lieutenants. With an average GPA, of ROTC candidates range from 3.0 to 3.5, and it's been steadily improving since 2006. The registrar has completed successful implementation of an electronic transcript ordering system and electronic transcript delivery to expedite transcript processing. The VESPA Choir, it, as Dr. Benjamin already noted, the internationally known VESPA Choir, has performed at the Arkansas uh, Chorale Society and they've also uh, uh, performed at eight churches and five schools in the past year doing their spring tour. The marching band, under the direction of John Graham, has uh, uh, performed in many, many different venues. The Division of Finance and Administration reports that the university 
did not receive any new funding from the state this year, we held steady. In these difficult times, in these hard times, that is good news. <laughs> we <clears throat> received some reduction in federal funds. However, enrollment has continued to decline this year, which has touched on our finances, and we seek a reversal very soon. Even with these factors, the university has had a good year fiscally, a sound year fiscally. The Board of Trustees approved the university uh, operating budget at 60 million. This includes board approval of a tuition and fee increase of 4.3%. In student financial services, more than $34 million in, in federal aid and state aid and institutional scholarships, tuition waivers, discounts, et cetera, were awarded to students. 34 million is the word. Effective January 1st, 2013, the Office of Student Financial Services was moved uh, into the Division of uh, Finance and Administration, uh, where they immediately began working on enhancing customer service and communications. Uh, being on the leading edge of technology, we wanted to make better use of our technology to be more efficient and to better serve our students. If, so far, they've mandated that students utilize the university's email system as a means of communication, and there's no longer uh, cutting paper refund checks. Refunds are now delivered online uh, via deposit by my UAPG card. There's a special place in my heart for people who work in student financial services. I feel you. <laughs> the student financial services staff, uh, they work hard and, and, and you know in the next couple of weeks they're on the front lines, literally. And uh, you know when it gets to financial matters and sometimes it, it gets a little emotional, but they can handle it then they, and they're working on it, so I applaud them. In the physical plant, one of our major opportunities was the purchase of a new cloud-based com computerized maintenance management system, Maintenance Direct. It's a step toward our goal of, of paperless processing. The uh, MD, as it's called, will enable us to provide better service to our customers by providing real-time feedback on work status. It is also completely online and will reduce paper use by as much as 66%. The custodial services have implemented automatic dilution stations to dispense chemicals in the spring semester. We anticipate a 20 to 30 percent reduction in cleaning costs in fiscal year 2014. Additionally, our cleaning chemicals are green seal uh, certified. The technical services successfully completed 2.1 million upgrade on hardware, which allows us to stay on top of the ever-changing world of technology. In the Office of University Relations and Development, they continue to bring in the money. They were able to successfully bring in uh, over a million dollars this year. That includes over a half million dollars in individual donations. That includes 279,000 from corporations, 24,000 from foundations, and 160,000 from other organizations. The uh, <clears throat> Also, uh, in our, our Title III, as you know, we, we are a Title III school. We re received Title III funding. We've had an impact of over, over $4.5 million. This year, uh, the uh, uh, providing opportunities in education. Uh, the, uh, uh, you're familiar with the number of the activities that are done uh, by, the, uh, by the Title III grant. That grant has really been a catalyst for a number of things to happen here on the campus of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. It has, it has been a real, a real funding source for um, use in things that touch the very lives of our students in providing things like internships for students and in, uh, in providing opportunities uh, for students to improve their skills, providing opportunities for students to experience the latest technology and learning and classroom improvement in laboratories. Uh, 
and uh, to provide these kinds of uh, safe and secure and advanced educational environments. It is helping to change the lives on uh, the life on our campus and helping to improve and build capacity on the campus. Our federal contracts and grants awarded to UAPB last year came to around $11 million in research and, in research and, and contracts and another $5 million in the Title III grants came to a total of about $16 million has been the impact. In athletics, we've had numerous success stories, as you know, in this past year. Academically, 32 students, 32 student athletes received their degrees during the 2013 commencement exercises. 16 of those graduated with honors. That's half of those who graduated graduated. Twelve of those student athletes had grade point averages between 3.4 and 3.8. Ten of the 16 athletes hold cumulative averages of above 3.0. The Golden Lions football team captured its first outright SWAC championship. And the victory over Jackson State last November in the Toyota SWAC championship game in Birmingham, Alabama. Victory capped a school record 10 and 2 season for the football team. <laughs> Meanwhile, many of our other teams saw their win loss record improve uh, over the past year. We had three coaches, three coaches who were selected as SWAT coaches of the year in their sport head coach Monty Coleman, women's basketball coach Nate Kilbert and head baseball coach Carlos James. <laughs> the Division of Student Affairs would process more than 6,000, 6,000 applicants, 4,400 of them were web applications. They've implemented an after-school mentoring program for high school students called Beyond the Bricks. Uh, those are future students coming here, by the way. Beyond the Bricks, and they are uh, an initiative to help uh, uh, African-American males from the Dalloway and Pine Bluff High School districts. Uh, the Office of Disability Services was named a, a military, we, we were named a military friendly school for this upcoming year. The uh, UAPB Lion to Success Mentor Program trained 20 students to serve as peer mentors for the year and uh, we've installed cameras on each resident hall floor this year in, in, in public safety, the all-important area of public safety, emergency mass notification was accomplished through the Rave Alert system, which is a wireless web-based program dedicated primarily toward mobile applications. Alerts can be initiated on and off campus. In career services, we had 139 of our, of our uh, top students above 3.0 get placements from cooperative education and internships and permanent positions, a 59% placement rate for those who came through and were serviced by the office. In the past year, we published the very first UAPB Pride magazine. We established the first annual Chancellor's Excellence Awards for faculty and staff. We met reporting requirements for the Higher Learning Com uh, Commission of uh, the North Central Association. Uh, accrediting association for UAPB. The, uh, <clears throat> we published 165 news releases uh, in state and national media, facilitated the planning of the, chan of the Chancellor's fall and spring convocations and the Chancellor's management workshop in January. As I noted earlier, we're an institution that is student-focused, success-driven, and mission-based. Our student body remains our lifeblood, our center, our core, our rise on detra, the very reason for our existence. We have a faculty, staff, and administration who are committed to the mission and focused on our goals of student success. And likewise, we have a committed alumni base that is strong and effective leadership. They wear the black and gold with great symbolism and pride and depth of meaning. 
They don't mind taking out a little green every now and then <laughs> to bless the alma mater. They don't mind pulling out a checkbook on a moment's notice and writing a note or draft to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff Foundation, all to show their love for dear mother. It is no secret that our goal starting out will be achieving the gold standard for the Golden Lion. We aspire to the gold standard in overall academic excellence, including teaching, research, and service. We seek growth in size and in stature. We measure that achievement not only in the size of the student population, but in the success of the students through graduation and beyond. We seek advancement of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff through the development of new resources from proud alumni, faculty grants, <coughs> staff grants, corporations, donors, and friends. I want to make clear, though, that the work here that we're talking about, the work that we have before us, it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about the students. As I started out, I said Veronica and I arrived here uh, not too long ago, I guess about uh, eight weeks ago. And um, we, uh, for those of you who may know us, we're, our home was in Gainesville, Florida, home of the Florida Gators, which uh, is a way of life in that town on Saturdays. There we experienced championship athletics, and so we were very excited and very happy in last November. We were cheering on the Golden Lions as we watched them take a championship. It's events like that that really, you really get to feel the pride of UAPB. Because even for those of you, even for the most academically oriented person in this institution, what happens nationally on national televi television affects you and me and all of us. And when it is positive news, we must celebrate it and we must recognize it. And we must use it to benefit the greater university. We must capitalize on it. I do want to mention that we are very, we, we offer our congratulations and kudos once again to, 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 to Coach Coleman and, and A.D. Hardy and, and, and all, all the people and the players. You know, the players, they get some credit too. If I were their coach, I'd say they get all the credit because they go out on the field and, and, uh, and, they, and they get the job done. And I say to them, kudos, we commend you, let's do it again. <laughs> Veronica and I are both native, uh, natives of New Orleans and I hail from the Ninth Ward uh, in New Orleans. Uh, we're both first generation college graduates. I'm the youngest of five children. Uh, uh, <coughs> She also came from a family of five children. Um, we're working parents who understood the primacy of education in the lives of their children. We've been married for 25 years now. We celebrated 25 years ago. Three children, all sons. Uh, the eldest, Brandon, is uh, an academic advising specialist at Santa Fe College uh, in Gainesville. So he's in higher ed. Uh, uh, he is married, has two beautiful children. Uh, the next one, David, is in college at the University of Florida. And the youngest, Tyler, is a young man of Morehouse College. Uh, we are here because we believe in the mission of this HBCU. Over the years, I've been involved in several partnerships with HBCUs, and I launched a program at the University of Florida to recruit students from HBCUs to the graduate school there. I served as Chief Graduate Diversity Officer at the <coughs> University of Florida, caring for all of our Black and Latino and Native American graduate students, 
because it is about the students. I've had three or four careers so far. I've been a journalist, a lawyer. <laughs> A puppet, a pirate, a poet. <laughs> 26 years as a professor, 13 of them as an administrator. Most of my academic life has been in the trenches of one of the largest and most comprehensive and most complex universities in the world. The, during that time frame, Veronica as well has, been, <clears throat> has developed an expertise in human resources, administration, and she applied those skills for the last two decades in the areas of development and alumni affairs at the same large comprehensive complex university. And over the last 26 years, I've accumulated a record as a distinguished teacher and scholar and administrator that includes leadership experience in every aspect of university life, including academic and student affairs, success in research grant writing, both at NSF and DOE, success in fostering faculty research, in growth and development of student research programs, fostering student internship experiences, success in fundraising and development, and cultivating corporate partnerships, and working with alumni affairs, and engaging alumni. And I had the honor of providing cooperative transformational leadership on our campus to prepare PhD graduates for the workforce with the help of a million dollar NSF grant. And just so you know, I don't think I'm all that. <laughs> I'm just a poor boy from the projects in New Orleans. A product of the public schools, a resident of public housing, from a family on public assistance that made it, yes, on food stamps too. We got around on public transportation because for much of that time we had no car. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to, my, to the Lord my God and to his immeasurable love, <laughs> grace, and mercy. The University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff is a real gem in the University of Arkansas system that offers tremendous opportunities for the institution, its partners, and the surrounding area of Pine Bluff. It's an HBCU with a rich history of high quality education, research, outreach, and engagement. As a native of the Deep South, I am aware of the history and prestige of this university, and I am encouraged by the dynamic promise and prospect for its future. I've long known about the institution and the great faculty and staff and students and alumni who are having a profound impact on the state of Arkansas and the nation. I heard a little music. I'm coming to a close. <laughs> but for me, this is my calling. To use all that God has endowed me with to educate our students, to help them to advance, and therefore help society to advance. I'm excited about UAPB because it is the flagship of the Delta and because there is tremendous, it has had a tremendous impact on African Americans, our history, our culture, our institutions and the greater society. UAPB has a long and distinguished history, starting out as an 1890 land grant institution, the only HBCU in the state of Arkansas and the second oldest public university in the state the only public HPC. We, we will need all of the alumni and friends and stakeholders to assist us in moving to the next tier of greatness. We will seek your support and the support of the faculty and staff in these areas. In enrollment management. Enrollment management, for those of you, you've heard that term a whole lot, it involves the the, re the recruitment, the success, the graduation of our students. It is an integrated way of dealing with uh, and working with students for student success. But that is an area certainly of primary focus for us at this university. Increased funding 
increased funding from performance-based funding. More and more states, and Arkansas is no different, will be moving more toward performance-based funding, at least for part of their budgets. In order to succeed in a performance-based environment, you've got to perform well. Your students must, you must show student success and demonstrate it. And we will be able to do that because we will be focused on it. Increase the annual research dollars we're bringing in and bringing a research renaissance to this campus. I mentioned some figures a few minutes ago that we had achieved about $16 million of, in, in federal research and dollars and contracts in the past year or so. That is a good point of entry for this institution. As your new chancellor, I will be pushing that number higher. I will be pushing for us to move it higher and to engage more with faculty, with staff, where there are opportunities and where those opportunities are consistent with our goals and our mission. We want to get all that we can to do the job that we have before us. We want to increase donations from alumni, friends, prospects, people who have an interest either in the institution or in the mission of the institution or individuals in the, in the institution doesn't matter to me what their interest is as long as they're interested in donating to the cause. <laughs> However, I want you to understand this because I want this to be clear, that we do not need to bend 50 different ways in order to achieve success in the area of giving and donations. However, there are some generally known and understood principles about giving of which we are, we've been practicing for a number of years at that big university I mentioned earlier. But, the, but and, and there's some generally understood universal principles in development uh, uh, that, that we intend to use and that we intend to apply. And we intend to go about this process in a very measured and principled approach to fundraising and development. I do want to make that clear. I want to advance research and professional partnerships. We want to engage in other entrepreneurial activities. And uh, uh, we mentioned uh, in our earlier comments about the increase that we've seen in online learning. Uh, uh, some people, we have to look at online learning as the next wave in technology, but in this enterprise, it is also an entrepreneurial activity because you're putting this product out there, the product that is developed at this university for consumption by the masses in the community. So, so it is an entrepreneurial activity. We want to focus special attention on the STEM areas and on the biomedical and life sciences. But we will not leave behind the arts, the humanities, and social sciences. As you heard in my bio, that's my background. <laughs> we want to assist in providing le a leadership role in large-scale donations and foundation-based fundraising and development. We want to make sure that all students get a multifaceted experience to prepare them to, to thrive in the 21st century. In the 21st century, century globalized society. We want the best students that we get here to work toward recognition. Our students, the, the best way to, to measure up how your students compete is for your students to compete for recognition, for national internships, for national opportunities, contests, awards, scholarships, the Rhodes, the Beinecke, the Goldwater, the Trumans, the Fulbrights. We have our students competing at that level nationally for NSF graduate research fellowships. But we will need to continue to recruit our students. We will continue to recruit from the Delta. We will continue to recruit some of the very best students nationally, both inside and outside of Arkansas. And that's where we all come in, because we do need to work together 
to identify the best students that are there, the best students that are there who want to come to UAPB, who want to join the Golden Lion Nation of any race or background that want a quality education at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We want to connect them to the Office of Admissions. We want to connect students with high GPAs and ACTs. And we want to make sure that we have the resources developed to provide the necessary scholarships that's going to attract and retain. We need everyone who has a stake in the future of this university and everyone who cares about the future of this institution to help recruit students to the university. Give me, give me and others on our team the chance to connect with prospects, the chance to connect with parents. Bring them to us. We'll talk to them, we'll sit down with them, we'll give them the necessary information that they need. When we land some good students, when we do land, and we do land really very phenomenal students, when we land some good students, we want, you, we, we want you to get inside those schools and meet their guidance counselors. We want to meet their teachers. We want to meet their principals because we want to build strong ties and establish pipelines. That w and we want to build pipelines to this university that will be sustainable long into the future. Suffice it to say that we are delighted to be here. So we look forward to working together. We look forward to a brighter day in the future of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. The best is yet to come. We are proud to be members of the you know, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff family and the Golden Lion Nation. We wish you the very best for the upcoming year. We pray God's blessings upon the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We thank you. Um, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned that I would have time for questions, I have, I have two. Thank you. Dr. Benjamin, the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs has yielded eight minutes of her time. So, um, if, if, if there are any questions, I would, I, I, I would like to um, address them. Good morning, Chancellor. Good morning. Um, can you break down those three points you talked about, being student-focused and success-driven and mission-based, maybe give us kind of a couple of breakdown points between those? Okay, good. Yes, I, I, I will. Um, uh, the uh, the student-focused, student success-driven, because when we talk about student focused, I think we're, we, have, we, have, we, we, we have strong consensus that we are here for the students and that without the students we wouldn't be here. And, and so if, if we are to, 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 to truly achieve higher levels of success, we have to really, um, I guess, concentrate and, 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 and concentrate our programs and our agenda around our number one clientele. Our students, uh, in, you know, a long time ago, we never liked to talk about students as consumers. But uh, uh, for the, because, and I understand that, being an academic for almost 30, 26 years now, to, uh, 27 years, I understand that uh, uh, because when you talk about consumers, they used to say uh, the customer is always right. And look, I'm telling you, um, <clears throat> students in my class are not always right. But, but, um, but, but, under, but we understand that beyond that, they, the, the students are customers in that, in that they, they come with uh, an expectation, an expectation of receiving something that, that when they when they enter this university, they enter this university and go through four years, and some of them may take five, we hope not longer, 
but, uh, but, but they may, in that four or five years, we hope that we have enough that is focused on, on the things that, the, the, the thing, the, all the programs and other things that we've created have, have been enough student focused so that when they come out in the end as a, as a product of this institution, that they can demonstrate uh, what this institution has meant to them, that we have made them better, that we have prepared them for careers, that we have prepared them for leadership. The, 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 the success driven is inextricably tied to that notion that when we can bring students through, and, and, and if, our, if our programs are well designed and the students are, are, are um, going through our programs, then they are successful, they are, they're, they're student success. And mission base, of course, is tied to our, 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 our mission as a university and our evolving mission as the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Yes, I, I can. Uh, the um, importance, the question was to expand on the importance of enrollment management. Um, uh, the, um, and we've had some uh, conversations about that, uh, 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 Dr. Hertz and I, and, and he's the one who raised the question. The, um, uh, uh, we met uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin and, 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 and others yesterday um, to, the, to, to, to talk about Enrollment management. Enrollment management is, 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 is really has become very central to, the, to university success. And in a place where there has been declines in enrollment, enrollment management and, and, and where retention is very much an issue, it is a, an issue of primary concern. It's an issue of primary concern for the institution's future. That is, will it have students in the future, right? And where will those students come from? And what will be the quality of those students? Enrollment management deals with the quality of the students who enter the institution, deals with the numbers of students that enter the institution, and it deals with the success of those students as they migrate through the institution and then uh, 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 their success as graduates of the institution. And it is important to every aspect of the institution and its future, including its, uh, its very accreditation. The accreditation of the institution is tied to its success in enrollment management. So we are coming up for reaccreditation in, about, in, in another uh, three years, another three years, I believe, 2016. 1617. Um, and, and, and one of the things that the that the accrediting our accrediting body will be looking at very closely is how we've dealt with our enrollment management issues. They've they've looked at it in the past and we've presented some responses to their questions at a midterm report. But 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 when they come on campus in 2016-17 we need to have it fixed. Right. Our enrollment management plan ought to be one that, uh, that, that, that is one that is goal oriented, that is it sets goals and achieves goals. It ought to be one with experienced personnel, those who are experienced in enrollment management, guiding it and leading it. But it needs the helpful encouragement and support of the university. Because all of the items, we can talk about enrollment management and, and, and getting students in and all that, but it comes back to this, to this issue of customer service, customer satisfaction. It, it, it does come back to that. It comes back to what they get academically and what they get socially and administratively while their students here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. One point, and this is not directly related to your question, but it's related to this issue of customer service and satisfaction. And that is, when you're serving any constituent here, it could be a student, could be a faculty member, could be a staff member, could be a visitor. 
Where is your next multi-million dollar gift coming from? That's something to think about. That person sitting in front of you who looks like an 18 or 19 year old who can't find his or her way through the classes and can't quite get their money straight at that time may be the next entrepreneurial developer that's going to develop the next enterprise and it's not going to be good when we have to approach them. Dr. Martin Hall, when we have to approach them for finances or to donate back to a university that did not provide them the customer satisfaction on the front end. So we need to concentrate on that. And, oh, I, and I see Dr. Benjamin approaching. And, and, we, and we, we need to focus on that as a good in and of itself. But also, we need to keep in the back of our mind that we are serving an important constituency and every student here is important to us. Thank you. accept his challenge. When you are standing, you are standing to accept his challenge. <laughs> Chancellor Alexander, uh, we want to present two awards to you. This one you may take home and open with Ms. Veronica, but the other one is symbolic of how Dean Martin introduced you in Chicago. <coughs> She introduced you as the top lion, the head lion, and we are presenting you the head of this lion <laughs> to let you know what we expect of you. I don't know if you feel your page, your note page. I did mine and I found an extra sheet of paper so I could take notes as the chancellor spoke. He has a lot in there about the past and our legacy a lot about where we currently are, but also a lot about where we are headed. And so our next speaker is going to give us ideas and information on how to deal with change. She will be introduced by Ms. Georgette Wiley, who is an Associate Director at the John B. Watson Memorial Library, Mrs. Wiley. Good morning. Good morning. I have been given the honor of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Beverly Divers White. When Dr. Divers White's name was first recommended as a presenter for today, everyone began to respond with words like awesome, dynamic, and innovative to describe her as a speaker and as an engaging presenter with relevant and powerful information to share. A review of her accomplishments is a testament to why she deserves the words used to describe her. Dr. Divers White has been recognized for her profound achievements as a civic and educational leader and she has been the recipient of the Outstanding Professional Woman of the Year Award, the Martin Luther King Community Service Award, as well as the Arkansas Martin Luther King Jr. Commission Salute to Greatness Award. Additionally, she was awarded the 2011 Southern Minority Leadership Council's Arkansas Leadership Award and she was the 2010 honoree of an award sponsored by Just Communities of Arkansas. Dr. Divers White began her career in philanthropy as the Senior Program Manager for the Education Workforce Alliance, which was an initiative to create a globally competitive workforce in selected rural Delta communities. She earned her bachelor's degree in English from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, 
her master's in counseling psychology from the University of Central Arkansas, and her EDD in educational administration from the University of Arkansas. She has also completed further studies at Michigan State University, Yale University, and Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Islam. Israel, I'm sorry. Dr. Divers White has served as an adjunct professor at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, so she's a homegirl familiar with Lion Country. Arr. <laughs> <laughs> and the Clinton School of Public Service in Little Rock, where she was selected to be the mentor of the Women of Color Initiative, which was a special mentoring program for emerging African American, Native American, and Latina professionals. Dr. Divers White is currently president of BSW Consulting and Technology and BSW development. She also works as district consultant to Clarksdale Municipal School District in Clarksdale, Mississippi as the school improvement officer. Our committed speaker has held current or former board memberships in organizations ranging from the United States Civil Rights Commission, the Metroplex Economic Development Corporation in Dallas, Texas, the Arkansas Chapter of Top Ladies of Distinction, the Hazen Foundation in New York City, to the Arkansas Cradle to Prison Pipeline Initiative, and many more. With all of her commitments, she is furthermore a dedicated member of First Baptist Church in Little Rock and has been blessed to work with a wide variety of congregations and denominational conventions throughout America and in several foreign countries. Please join me in welcoming to the podium another awesome presenter this morning, Dr. Beverly Divers White. Mrs. Wiley, thank you for that introduction. I had to kind of think, wonder who she's talking about. <laughs> to Chancellor Alexander, Mrs. Alexander, welcome to Arkansas. Right. I feel like the prodigal daughter this morning because it's been several years since I've been at UAPB, but I really have strong, strong regard for the Golden Lions family. So good morning, Golden Lions. I want to share with you some comments titled, Lest We Forget, The Legacy of World Great Greatness Must Continue. Again, Lest We Forget, The Legacy of World Greatness Must Continue. And I want to begin with some simple truths that you will see on the screen.
You are great. You have a legacy of greatness. The University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff is an 1890 land-grant institution, an historically black college and university. You currently have a diverse population, exceptionally well-prepared faculty members, and a variety of competitive degree offerings. For over 138 years, you have striven to create an environment that includes learning and an emphasis on promoting students for success in life. You faculty members expect your students to fulfill their potential. Originally known as Branch Normal College, this agricultural, mechanical, and normal college was established with the Legislative Act of 1873. This act stipulated that the college was established for the convenience and well-being of the poorer classes. The second provision established in the land grant of 1890 made the Morrell Act of 1862 applicable in every respect for the agricultural, mechanical, and normal college. This act, without excluding the scientific and classical studies, mandated the teaching of agriculture and the mechanic arts. As more, one of more than 100 historically black colleges and universities in the United States, your historical mission was to educate African Americans. The mission emanated from the era when the primary responsibility was to educate the freed slaves to read and write. At the dawn of the 21st century, along with graduate and postgraduate degrees, as a historically black university, you offer Ameri African American students, as well as other students, a place to earn a sense of identity, heritage, economic empowerment, and community. In the early years of your existence, you had to provide preparatory courses at the elementary and high school levels. As the students developed the basic skills, you were able to offer the classical liberal education that was dominant in American higher education. You offered languages, language courses, the natural sciences, sciences and humanities. African Americans were trained to, for literacy, for teaching, and for the professions. In addition, students were encouraged to receive industrial training. Given the influence of W.E.B. Du Bois and his contemporaries, by the end of World War I, like the other historically black institutions, A.M. and N. emphasized the development of its students with an understanding of black life and culture. Many of the students who matriculated at the University of Arkansas came from poverty-stricken rural and urban communities. Many of the students who came to AM and N came from homes where the parents lacked a high school education. Many of the students at AM and N came from families where they were the first to go to college. Many of the students who came to AM and N did not know what was required to receive a degree and were not truly, not truly prepared for post-secondary education. Many of the students who came to AM and N did not know the positive attributes and contributions of their history and culture. Many who came to AM and N had a dream of a better life, but did not have a clear vision or step-by-step -step goals for making the dreams a reality. Lest you forget, these were the students who came to AM and N, and you, the administrators, and faculty accepted the challenge of educating the whole student. You accepted the challenge of educating the students to excellence. You accepted the challenge of developing world-class citizens into greatness. As your mission evolves with Chancellor Alexander, you have stated that you will continue to maintain a special sensitivity to the needs, aspirations, problems, 
and opportunities of your historic constituents. You shall expand your mission with a high degree of excellence and with a sense of constantly, constantly improving quality. You will develop creative and innovative curriculum models. You will implement new instructional designs and maintain professionals capable of implementing these programs. Let's take a look this morning at the challenges you face here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff in this, the 21st century. Really, the more things change, the more they remain the same. These students and others are victims of their circumstances. These circumstances include the following. Poverty. Poverty impacts children, especially African-American children throughout America. More than two-thirds of children born poor will be persistently poor throughout their childhoods. Black children are seven times more likely than white children to be persistently poor. 60% of black children born between the years of 1985 and 2000 were raised in neighborhoods with a poverty rate of over 20%. Family structure and income impact family support systems and often create daunting challenges. 51% of black children live with only their mother. Black children are over six times as likely as white children to have a parent in prison and twice as likely to be in foster care. They are twice as likely as white babies to be born to a teen mother. Income level of black children's families are at the bottom fifth of the income distribution. Adding to this, educational level attainment levels in pre-K through 12 contribute to the overrepresentation of poor and minority children in grade retention, out of school suspensions, and special education that have also interacted with low teacher expectations, student discouragement, low self-esteem, and disengagement from school. Too many students experience less qualified teachers inadequate education, facilities, and few resources. Black children and poor children fall further and further behind as they progress through school. You know it as the achievement gap. In fourth grade, 84% of black public school students cannot read at grade level, and 83% cannot do math at grade level. In eighth grade, 86% of black public school students cannot read at grade level, and 87% at the end of the eighth grade cannot do math at grade level. Black students scored the lowest of any racial ethnic group on the ACT and SAT college entrance exams. Teacher experience in school curriculum have influenced an influence on the preparation that these students receive. 15% of teachers in schools with the most black students are in their first or second year of teaching. You know this in the Delta. We have to rely on Teach for America. Black children are not proportionately enrolled in gifted and talented education programs or enrolled in higher level English, math, and science programs. Many do not matriculate in an institution that offers a foreign language. Job status and income of young adults is an impact. It's a serious circumstance for poor and black students. The recession has created an extremely difficult labor market for all youth, but poor and minority youth face the harshest impact. At the turn of 2012, almost one in three black young adults ages eight, 16 to 24 was unemployed, unemployed. In the year 2012, the unemployment rate for young black college, college graduates now, aged 21 to 24, averaged 10.8%. The unemployment rate for black males, 
ages 20 and over was 14%, more than twice of that for other populations. What we have seen over the last two decades as we compare the achievement levels of children pre-K through 12 with 70 industrialized countries, our children are falling further and further behind. And yet, Chancellor Alexander, we continue to have some of the best colleges and universities anywhere. People want to come to our colleges and universities. Too many researchers, sociologists, psychologists, and educators label these poor and black students. They term, use terms, and I hope you haven't, terms like at risk, culturally deprived and disadvantaged students to describe the students that come to your institution. They use these terms to describe our most important resources, our children and our youth. These terms promote a deficit model of our young adults. We must begin to use terms like at promise, at potential, and at greatness. <laughs> In your program, this was stated, but I will state it again. John P. Watson, the first president of AM and N College, stated in his philosophy, the end of education is to know God and the law and purposes of the universe and to reconcile one's life with these laws. The first aim of a good college is not to teach books, not to teach books, but to teach the meaning and purpose of life. Hard study and learning of books are only a means to an end. We are to develop power, courage, and determination in our students. And we are to enable them to go out to achieve faith, wisdom, and justice. If we don't come to this end, Dr. Watson said, the cost of schooling is wasted. Your challenges are great, but you remain very relevant Golden Lions. While you are one of the 105 public and private historically black colleges, which comprise only 3% of the colleges in America, you educate more than 20% of the African American graduates through HBCUs. You have excelled UAPB in preparing students in the fields of science, technology, engineering, medicine, and mathematics. You have demonstrated great effectiveness in fostering academic success. In fact, according to the National Science Foundation, almost a third of all doctoral degrees awarded in the areas of science to African Americans went to men and women who attended undergraduate degree in undergraduate institutions, the historically black college. You are relevant. You are relevant, and you are powerful. Do not minimize what you do and to whom you do among the least of us. Lest you forget, you are great. As you continue to evolve your mission through both your new and seasoned leadership members, I offer six suggestions for maintaining your legacy of greatness. One, model enlightened leadership. Enlightened leadership leaders are individuals who not only have a vision, but who also have the ability to get the members of the institution to accept the vision as their own, thus developing the commitment to carry it out throughout the campus. In fact, Enlightened leaders do not have to have the vision themselves. They need only to possess the willingness and the ability to draw the vision from their team members and inspire and empower these people to do what it takes to make the vision a reality. Enlightened leaders nurture and encourage their team members to be open, creative, and innovative and find what it takes to achieve what is necessary, and that's the shared objectives. Enlightened leadership is not so much about things to do as it is a place leaders come from 
where you come from, with whatever you do. It is actually a state of being. The challenge facing the University of Arkansas at Plan Bluff demands fundamentally new models of thinking and responding. Two, Chancellor Alexander, you're going to have to deal with the mindset issues. The 80-20 rule of thumb suggests that 20% of the faculty will be open to change, while 80% will be resistance to change in varying degrees. The faculty members' perceptions of themselves and how they believe others perceive them defines their self-esteem and their self-image here in the workplace. Self-esteem is a major factor in people's attitudes. People with low self-esteem may resist change because they interpret change as an indictment on their abilities. Reactive thinkers often see any request for change as a suggestion that something is wrong with them. Creative thinkers, however, tend to see a request for change as an opportunity and a challenge. Peter Block in The Empowered Manager stated, the source of all energy, passion, motivation, and an internal generated desire to do good work is our own feeling about what we are doing. Three, look at your focus. How and where individual faculty and the institution focuses their attention dramatically impacts the results that are achieved. A faculty member or school has a great deal of choice about what the focus will be. How and where the focus is given also determines what the, the faculty will attract more of. The amount of energy focused on problems reduces the energy available to move towards solutions. The attention and energy put into trying to avoid something frequently draws one closer to what is trying to be avoided. The, the distinction between focusing on what's wrong with and where we are going is the ability of the institution to achieve an objective. A primary role of leadership, and it's not just the leadership on the stage, it's all of you are leaders in this institution. The primary role of leadership at all levels is to manage where people's energy and attention are focused. James Allen has said, focus is the process of distorting one's scattered forces into one powerful channel. Four, empower the members of the institution. The University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff at this particular stage can make the paradigm shift. Literally overnight, when leaders at all levels are able to tap into each other's deepest needs to be empowered. The shift begins when there is a recognition of the need to dig below the surface, to teach the real issues, and to uncover the what's in it for me channel. The empowerment tool within any renewing institution is skillfully asking effective questions. Leadership members throughout UAPB must be masters of asking effective questions, and at being really great listeners. Structured effective questions set the framework for focusing and alignment all of the team's energy toward achieving the institutional greatness. Leaders employ strategies for balancing the critical aspects of nurturing the team members and creating results. Leaders throughout this auditorium must be empowered and clear in their intent to support individual faculty members and the entire team in finding their own solutions. Five, align the shared purpose and vision. With your new chancellor, you are renewing the UAPB high performance organization. To do this renewal, there must be a deep, clearly understood sense of purpose and mission. Your mission must be inspiring and elevating to the members of the institution. 
and to the people you serve, your students. A shared purpose and vision and the resultant alignment must come from the inner heart. You can't be about the head if you really care about this institution and your students. Outstanding organizational performance and deep personal fulfillment must work together and reinforce each other. A detailed description of the desired institutional environment generated from and through the entire faculty will provide a powerful shared vision for the move toward alignment. And six, move from rhetoric to action with students. Stop talking and start doing. As the institution implements change, all students must be nurtured and involved in the change process. Professionalism must be modeled. Each faculty member must be held to high standards of professionalism in their dress, moral and ethical values, in their instructional preparation, and in their classroom performance. Each faculty member should expect the same from the students. Each faculty member must focus on quality. Each faculty member must maintain a consistent focus on improving the quality of instruction. Each school should review formative and summative data to ensure there is a focus on improving student outcomes. Each faculty member should constantly upgrade his pedagogical skills to better meet the needs of the students and the instructional goals. Faculty members must engage in professional development opportunities to increase instructional knowledge and skills. Faculty must also provide to students who are lacking in basic skills, content knowledge, study skills, test taking skills, and other requisites for mastery in your classroom or content area. Each faculty member must be committed to teaching the whole student. <laughs> Students must know their own history and culture. Students must know the cultural norms and behaviors in our diverse society. And believe you me, they're not getting it in our public schools. They're not getting it in our churches. So this offers a challenge to you to help our students to know good manners, proper etiquette, how to communicate with other people. <laughs> Students must be taught the real career options and basic economic and entrepreneurial skills. We need more of our students understanding that you don't go to school to get a grant or a loan to buy a car, to get an apartment, And to be in debt sometimes as much as $40,000 by the time you graduate from a four-year institution. We need entrepreneurial skills training because too few of us recognize the importance of owning something for ourselves. The entire institution must employ non-traditional strategies in recognition of this gap in achievement of many of our students. The institution must develop a relationship with public school institutions to better understand why the gap continues to exist and to assist them with improving academic outcomes for their high school graduates. Dr. Alexander says he wants top quality students. I just came from a school district where we have been in the past excited if we could get a 15 ACT score. And that school district is no different from many of the others here in the state of Arkansas. The leadership should implement strategies with public schools as well as within the College of Education to increase the number and quality of teacher education majors, to partner with STEM and foreign language areas to provide professional development for pre-service and senior public school teachers. There is a demographic imperative. 
our nation's population is changing. There is a social imperative. If you want to protect your home and your communities, there is a social imperative. There is an economic imperative. If you're like me, ready to receive social security, ready to receive retirement, then you need to think about who is working in the workforce to provide that history for you. Right. Too many of our students, regardless of socioeconomic background, gender, race, or ethnicity, are coming to UAPB and our other institutions having to take remedial courses. Too many of our students do not complete the undergraduate requirements. Too many of our students are coming to the institution woefully unprepared for college. UAPB, I quote educator Steve Perry, push has come to shove. You must somehow provide the students the education they deserve. There can be UAP faculty no excuses. You are still relevant. Faculty expectations must be high. Peer support for faculty and students must be strong. You must be the role models. Your legacy is worthy of preserving and strengthening. Your legacy of developing leaders and an ethos of community service must be maintained. You have historically educated leaders who understood the importance of reaching back as they moved forward, to lift as they climb. You must continue to develop graduates who are well-educated and well-rounded. Your graduates must continue to be inspired and optimistic and to have educated minds and entrepreneurial spirits. Your students must leave UAPB with a deeper appreciation of excellence. You can and you must assist America in building a new social organism that will accommodate racial, ethnic, and cultural pluralism in a manner that will enhance the quality of lives and patterns of living and mold the nation into one people with liberty and justice, not for just a few, but for all. UAPB, I came by this morning to remind you of your legacy. You are grateful creatures. You manage risk. And you are comfortable being uncomfortable. You focus on being. You have a vision and you are solutions oriented. You are responsible. You are eager to learn. You have chosen growth for yourselves and for the UAPB students. You strive not on being good, but you strive on being great. You are members of the world class today, and I honor, I honor and celebrate you. Thank you very much. You have been given the formula for change, and, and I appreciate your attention to it. Uh, Dr. White, would you please come back? And Ms. Wiley, would you come forward? We'd like to acknowledge you with a gift. On behalf of the University of Arkansas faculty, staff, and students, please rise to thank her for that incentive, that encouragement. She's giving us the charge.